Hello everyone, um, thank you very much. It's an honor to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Rudy Swart and I'm affiliated with uh, George Campus Nelson Mandela University. So, nice now forest trees are pollinated by insects, hypothetically speaking. The majority of trees have small white flowers. It's quite a conspicuous phenomenon. If we move towards the canopy, so the upper layer of the Neisner forest, we see that it's almost exclusively small white flowers. Now that's very interesting. I was in Springbok in Namakwaland when I first realized this actually. And um, so here are some examples. Is this the red thing? Yes. Okay, so this is saffron, small white flowers, uh, Ilex meters or Cape Holly, small white flowers, stinkwood, small white flowers. Uh, it is quite conspicuous, there's the word again. Uh, especially given that these trees are phylogenetically isolated or not really closely related to one another. So it does seem to be some sort of convergence that has happened in the past. Or there's selective pressures in the canopy selecting for this uh, pollination syndrome. Now this interested me. I wanted to find out what pollinates, what pollinates uh, the lies in the forest trees. And of course, if you want to figure that out, you need to get up there. Um, and so I had to learn how to climb trees, and I learned from the best. So this is the tree climbing grandfather, uh, Leon Fisser, and he earlier this year climbed the tallest planted tree in the world, not in South Africa, in the world, but it is in South Africa, in uh, Mahubas Kloof, and it is 83.7 meters tall, exactly, not one centimeter <laughs> up or down. Um, the tallest that I went up was about 17, 18 meters, so I have about 65, no, don't, my math is not good, but I have lots more to, to go to end up uh, like that guy over there. Uh, that is not an agogwe or an utang, uh, that's me up there in the tree. Uh, maybe you've heard that rumor. Anyway, uh, I don't think it exists, by the way. So I choose four species of tree that have small white flowers to investigate whether or not pollination in this system is a generalist sort of phenomenon. Is, it, is there room for special, specialization in this system? Uh, and the species I focused on was white pear, uh, saffron, assegai, and cape holly. You don't need to remember the names, just uh, follow, <laughs> follow along. So uh, I spent a total of 144 hours up in the canopy. Uh, during or between September last year and just the beginning of February this year. So it was uh, very nice to be up there. Uh, so saffron, uh, and this includes daytime and nighttime um, observations. So the nighttime ones were pretty cool. So I went up two hours before sunset, watched the sunset, forgot about everything, <laughs> Uh, and then two hours after sunset as well to see whether or not there are moths that visit these flowers. Now for saffron, uh, to get to the story, the most dominant species was the Cape honeybee uh, that Melanie spoke about. Um, however, so apart from that, there was a rich diversity of other species, uh, and more, most notably the hoverflies, this dark green pizza slice here. Uh, that's a family of flies, Syrphidae. They hover uh, in front of flowers almost like, like hummingbirds. Um, so they were quite uh, prominent, and then 9% was or were other flies, so non surfed flies. So rich diversity, but the honeybee dominates. Uh, Cape Holly, a very similar picture. However, we see that um, this 11% year popping up, and those are wasps, so which is quite interesting, uh, especially given that I'm doing a lot of yeah, let's blame the battery. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, but everyone's still on the same page, right? Yes. Okay, so 11%. Uh, wasps, which we didn't see for saffron. It's quite interesting because Cape Holly is a dioecious tree, so there's def different male and female specimens, so pollen needs to be carried a bit further. And I'm not saying that's the reason why wasps are involved here. Uh, Cape Holly also produces copious amounts of nectar that saffron doesn't do, so maybe uh, the wasps are interested in the nectar and the distance pollen has to travel is, is irrelevant. But regardless, interesting pattern there and a different pattern. White pear or Apodites, we can see honeybees, Cape honeybee uh, 
decreasing to about a third, uh, and then hoverflies making up another large chunk, also about a third, again that family Surfidae, and then 30% other bees, all right? So the bees that Melanie spoke about, we have a, a huge diversity of bees in the Cape. Um, so evidently uh, for, for white bear, the pattern is a bit different. What is that green thing there? Uh, that's not an ant, that's beetles. Okay, so beetles also popping up. Like I'm seeing these results for the first time now. <laughs> um, and then for Asagai, a uh, beautiful indigenous tree, again honeybees, Cape honeybee about a third, so that's a single species, 20% uh, flies, 19% uh, hoverflies, and then we have a bunch of other hochaikis coming in here, uh, for example butterflies, beetles, wasps, uh, moth, and lacewing as well, which is um, the order Neuroptera, so they usually come about just after sunset. Um, so there's a lot going on. It's not necessarily a generalist system as I was predicting. You know, small white flowers, uh, they will be visited by the same insects all around. That's not the case. Um, now moving away from pure ecology towards the, the broader Southern Cape system, because I guess that's why we're here today, uh, that is a normal forest edge where you have forest in the background, fainbos in the foreground, and a nice protective barrier or insulation uh, typically dominated by Virgilia or Kierboom. Um, you would expect that this forest is much more insulated against external uh, factors such as radiation, wind, uh, ETC, ETC. When a fire comes, it's also perhaps a bit more protected than when there is no edge, uh, as is the case in this image over here. Now, this is a typical site in the Southern Cape where the edge is gone, forestry, historically, tended to plant right up to the forest edge, um, maybe to protect the pines themselves from fire damage because indigenous forests don't really burn in this area. But if you look at it from an ecological point of view, it is not, uh, it's not, it's not a nice situation, to put it lightly. Um, now this made me think, uh, with the help of some intelligent people at the university, that what if if we go back to this image here, what if there is pollinator sharing between fainbos over the ecotone into the forest canopy? Now that's never been investigated before. And now moving forward with this project, there's another example of a forest completely isolated in the landscape. This we see uh, all across the Southern Cape. Uh, the surrounding area was pine, but now it is, has been exited. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that the fainbos that com that's coming back is doing good. Um, but this offers us a unique opportunity now, with the pines gone, to look at connectivity of pollinators between fainbos and forest habitats. Uh, most of the pollinators I found up there are very small flyers, small insects, so you can expect that their mobility isn't that great. Uh, so how would you expect them to reach um, areas like that from, from far away distances. And what does that mean for the tree species in those forests? Are they still producing enough seed uh, or are we sitting with a situation of extinction debt that, I mean, we're thinking long term, 100 years along the line, what's the composition of that forest going to look like? Trees are long lived, so we need to think in <laughs> thousand year intervals almost. Uh, this is just an example of another a uh, disturbed edge where you can see the ecotone is completely destroyed. So, a few studies have looked at there's a forest patch uh, surrounded by uh, native fainbos, so that's basically a natural situation. So, a few studies have looked at the possibility of pollinator sharing between uh, different biomes. Um, about five years ago, I looked at ground dwelling insects uh, between forests and fainbos, but I only looked at large continuous forests. Um, and fainbos, not at these patches, and there were distinct insect groups um, in forest and in fainbos. But what about mobile flying pollinating insects? Are they able to cross these barriers? Uh, and what about the legacy effects of forestry uh, in these exit areas? So that's what we're doing now. Um, I've got the five minute sign now, so I should probably get going. But we're sampling. Um, flower visiting insects in fainbos as well as in forests at different heights. So there's a bucket understory, there's a bucket somewhere there, <laughs> sub canopy and canopy. Uh, and the area we're working in is north of 
this large forest between Tipale and Gona Mowood, and we're trying to look at connectivity in the in this heavily trans transformed and disturbed landscape. Now, comparative work from KwaZulu Natal tells us that it is possible. Uh, there, they don't have fainbos in forest; they have grassland in forest, and uh, funded by Mondi, they have new generation plantations. So the corridors uh, move. Uh, or allows for connectivity between grassland habitats. I think we can do the same with fainbos in these areas if we are to replant certain areas. We should take this into account. Uh, also, not plant all the way up to the forest edge, but leave at least some leeway for a natural ecotone to persist in the landscape. Uh, this will be to the uh, benefit of these forests, hypoth hypothetically speaking. Um, yeah, so there are some photos from the Natal Midlands. This is essentially what it looks like, the concept, where you have core areas, and around the core areas, you would leave some space for natural fainbos to also persist. Um, some articles that came out from that area, edge orientation, corridor width, important for butterfly diversity. Butterfly, there should be butterfly, of course. Uh, <laughs> wider corridors enhanced overall species richness, uh, the edge also makes a difference. So southern edges, forest species seem to prefer those. Northern edges, grassland species seem to prefer those. It might be the same here for fainbull species. Um, so a lot of considerations when, when um, planning these corridors. Uh, and this paper, they found that they support the establishment of a few wide corridors over many narrow corridors in production landscapes, although you have to work with what you have if we only have small narrow, then we should obviously use it. Um, and in this paper, they suggested, su suggested that uh, ecological networks slash corridors, same thing, uh, should be about 64 meters wide to, to ensure that insect diversity is uh, maintained and that edge effects um, are sort of accounted for. Uh, remnant grassland ecological networks or um, corridors in agroforestry can provide natural finger-like extensions from neighboring protected areas and therefore do have conservation value. Uh, I can't see why we can't do similar sort of uh, holistic landscape planning in the Southern Cape, especially now with all these exit areas, the invasion problem we have, uh, and so forth. Sort of a, f a blanket, fresh start, so we, we can really do it. Uh, so I think, and now we're working only in that northern regions, two minutes left, north of the big forest, but I do believe we can even move south of the forest into the agricultural landscape a bit more as well. Uh, I think it's possible to make the Southern Cape a benchmark uh, landscape globally for sustainability, uh, and we need to get the ball rolling before so people said, I don't know, 60 new families in George. Uh, <laughs> we, should, we should get started on this. Uh, I know it's a cliche to say it, but we need an holistic approach where everyone is involved. Uh, if you see you if you see yourself represented there, then yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I think uh, collaboration between the George campus and the Garden Route Scientific Services is, is key to making this work. I know it's optimistic, but it is realistic, and that's the most important thing. Uh, and lastly, before you clap your hands, <laughs> um, if, if you believe we can't make this happen, then I want you to look these pollinators in the eyes <laughs> and tell them that. And uh, I doubt anyone will be able to do that because, uh, obviously, um, so we need to make it happen. All right. Thank you.